Rutgers Camden is an inclusive and a supportive community where we do not shy away from difficult conversations about inequality. That is why Chancellor Tillis created this program as part of his 15 and in 5 initiatives. And moving forward, we will be inviting all academic departments to nominate future guest speakers to be a part of our lecture series. And selections will be made by a multidisciplinary committee. Unfortunately, it is too easy to think of relevant instances in today's world that are in desperate need of change. There are no quick solutions to fix the international problems of racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, xenophobia, and the many other types of discrimination. But open conversations, such as the one we are about to embark upon, can allow us to acknowledge the oppression and adverse outcomes associated with these issues. At this time, I'd like to invite Gabriella Green Howard, second year law student and president of the Black Law Students Association to introduce today's topic and our guest speaker. Hello everyone, my name is Gabriella Green Howard and we are honored to welcome Cheryl Cashin to Rutgers Camden to present her recent book, White Space, Black Hood, Opportunity Hoarding and Segregation in an Age of Inequality. Having earned degrees from Vanderbilt University, Oxford University as a Marshall Scholar, and Harvard Law School, Cheryl Cashin brings uh, decades of activism, scholarship, and hands-on experience to the stage. She has served as a clerk for the US Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall as an urban and economic policy advisor to President Bill Clinton's administration. And she is currently serving as Carmark Waterhouse Professor of Law, Civil Rights, and Social Justice at Georgetown Law. Her books have been nominated for the NAACP Image Award for Nonfiction, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Nonfiction, and were selected for Editor's Choice in the New York Times Book Review. She can be heard on NPR, PBS, Sirius XM, and other outlets, including the New York Times. It is my honor and pleasure to stand before you all and welcome Cheryl Cashin. Thank you so much, Gabriella Green Howard. You were awesome. It is so uh, such an honor and humbling to be the inaugural Chancellor's Lecture on Global Racial Reckoning and Civility. Uh, it helps to be a longtime friend of the Chancellor to be the first one. <laughs> and I want to thank you, Matthew, for all you've done to make this trip go very, very smoothly. It's just been a delightful day. Um, I'm particularly honored. Uh, to be part of Chancellor Tillis's, the beginning of his legacy. Um, I, I'm sure you already have a sense of what a change agent he is going to be. Um, and this is ambitious, so I'm, I'm going to try to meet uh, the challenge. So let's see how I do. Um, okay. Um, yeah, we got that already. All right, so this uh, book is the culmination of two decades of obsession, academic work on my part, with uh, why it is we are so very segregated despite our uh, fundamental values of equality. I have a degree in electrical engineering from our alma mater, Vanderbilt, but I'm also a self-taught historian, and you'll kind of see how I blend those disciplines um, in my work. Um, to get started, uh, this map, is Paul Jargowski here by any chance? He's, he's not, but anyway, this map was produced by the great Paul Jargowski, who is um, a leading light uh, in many fields, but particularly probably one of the most knowledgeable people about concentrated poverty. In, and you know, the, he developed this map. He's head of the Center for Urban Research and Education here at Rutgers. Let there be no mistake. Uh, premier research goes on at this university, and a lot more of it is coming under Chancellor Tillis's vision, right? Um, but. Uh, he tutored me about concentrated poverty as I wrote this book. And one of the things that he's known for 
in the field of, of this demography, uh, the field about concentrated poverty, is this 40% threshold. He's the one who established it. A neighborhood that has 40% or more of the people are poor is a demarcator for a distressed neighborhood. Um, the term, uh, uh, the word ghetto went from being a noun to an adjective, unfortunately. I use the hood because it has less connotations. But this is a map uh, which showed, you know, uh, is the more crimson it is, the more poor it is. Um, and the, the bluer it is, the uh, more affluent it is, 0 to 20 percent poverty. You know, look what happened in the first 15 years of the um, new millennium in the Philadelphia Camden area. The footprint of concentrated poverty exploded, and center city affluent white space became more defined, not less. Segregation is getting worse. And, what, and, and um, my book really gets at, well, how does this happen? It would not be possible for individuals exercising their individual preferences to create such stark structures, stark differences between North Philly and South Philly. You know, in a 15-year period, lots of uh, luxury and uh, development going on, um, and lots of distress, boarded up houses, disinvestment. Where does that come from? Um, I argue in this book, and this is the historian uh, in me, that each time this country seemed to have put to bed a peculiar black subordinating institution, it created another one. Um, from slavery to Jim Crow to the iconic black ghetto, iconic dark ghetto. And um, there's a story um, about uh, uh, the narratives. Each, each, each one was um, uh, animated by a pretty nasty anti-black um, stereotype. And this gets to the global perspective, right? Um, according to social dominance theory, human societies tend to organize as group-based social hierarchies in which at least one group enjoys greater social status and power than other groups. Uh, this is kind of what Isabel Wilkerson's cast is about. Members of the dominant group will have greater access to material goods, while subordinated groups are often forced to endure substandard housing, underemployment, dangerous and distasteful work, disproportionate punishment, stigma, and vilification. Throughout history, most societies have such hierarchies, and most countries have origin stories or what scholars call hierarchy-enhancing myths to justify the way things are. Um, and the origin myths promote patterns of behavior that constitute culture and reify, reify existing hierarchies. It just so happens that in the United States of America, um, despite our self-evident beautiful values of uh, universal human dignity, we have also had a dominant narrative of the superiority of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant to everyone else. And um, we, we are in a war for narrative domestically and globally. And one thing I learned in my decades of writing and, 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 and research, that whiteness and the idea of white supremacy was constructed in this country to solve a class conflict between elite whites and, and, and struggling whites. It had a political function to promote policies and structures that really only benefited a economic elite. And that story is going on globally. Um, we've had massive social inequality going on throughout the world in the last two decades in countries. I'm, I'm directly quoting, um, Lord, I'm forgetting his name, um, David Brooks. I'm directly quoting an, an, an editorial or op-ed from David Brooks in the New York Times over the weekend. Um, where he says, in country after country, groups of highly educated urban elites have arisen to dominate media, universities, culture, and uh, often political power, and great swaths of people feel looked down upon and ignored. And in this era, populists and autocrats, um, they, they lead with the narrative that stokes that resentment. To, to 
construct policies that, again, benefit economic elites. So that's the intersection with global development. Here, I'm talking about a present system of what I call residential caste, which I think um, um, this map reflects. Uh, and it wasn't inevitable. Um, I start my book with chapter two, um, talking about Philadelphia. And I start with um, my uh, double great-grandmother, Lucinda Baldre Cashin, who's found living on Clifton Street in Philadelphia, I believe the old Seventh Ward, I believe just below South Street, um, living in Philadelphia as the head of a household with a gaggle of uh, brown children named Cashin. And I say affectionately, you know, at that time, um, a steady stream of black Americans was coming to the Quaker City, often via the Underground Railroad, since the 1860s. Um, uh, Philadelphia had the largest black population of any northern city. It was the center of national black intellectual and institutional life. Um, you know, Mother Bethel is there. The AME Church was founded there. Um, uh, the Institute for Colored Youth, uh, now Cheney University, was founded there. Um, the head of the boys' department in the late 1860s was this giant, Octavius Valentine Caddo. If you don't know anything about him, Google him. He's awesome, right? He uh, had a classical education, head of the boys' department at a time when my great-grandfather was a student there, right? And so. Uh, I know he picked up some of his agitation, but he was leading um, grassroots movements. They, they were desegregated, the trolley cars, um, you know, laying down on the tracks, agitated for voting rights. And, and then I, I fast forward to the 1890s um, with W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote The Philadelphia Negro, basically invented the field of urban ethno ethnography with that book. Um, and he noted that about the 40,000 odd black people who were living in Philadelphia at the, in the 1890s were scattered throughout the city, right? They, they might be clustered on a few blocks here and there, but they were um, um, scattered through and lived near white people, which was a very common pattern of settlement uh, in northern cities. Um, it's only with the uh, Great Migration, when between the 1910s and the 1970s, more than six million people move north and west to escape uh, violence back Jim Crow and seek opportunity that black people begin to get contained in their own neighborhoods. They were contained, and I, and I mean tightly compacted, using violence, racially restrictive covenants, uh, and redlining in which the neighborhoods that they populated were intentionally cut off from the kind of public and private investment that was rained down on white neighborhoods. Uh, how many of you have heard of redlining? Everybody's heard of redlining. You know? <laughs> Richard Rothstein, The Color of Law, has, has, that, that history is no longer hidden. So quite a bit more awareness of it now. This is the HOLC map of Camden, right? And what, what happened, we have four grades from A, B, C, D. Red is D, literally called hazardous. Virtually everywhere the great migrants landed, um, they were contained and their neighborhoods were redlined, with very few exceptions. I cite a study in the book, a Fed study from uh, about 2018, which said, found that the decision to redline in the 30s correlates to this day for many neighborhoods, uh, many black neighborhoods in particular, with present segregation, disinvestment, and decline. And so the federal government um, begins this social engineering, um, institutionalizes anti-black, virulent anti-black processes in the um, um, financing and construction of neighborhoods, and then the government piles on. Now, typically, when I talk about this book, I start with this map. I added maps 
um, to, to make it relevant to, to, to this audience. But I typically start with this map. This is Minneapolis. And what are you seeing? This black star is where George Floyd was assassinated in the sort of somewhat bohemian, gentrifying neighborhood of Powderhorn. On the left, one uh, green dot is 100 black people. On the right, one red dot is 10 poor people. So you see the direct correlation between concentrated blackness and concentrated poverty. And what a lot of people don't realize is the George, George Floyd story is a story uh, about segregation. Um, my research assistant was born in Southwest, an affluent, poverty-free um, neighborhood. And he said that in Southwest, uh, you rarely saw the police. And when you did, they were just directing traffic. He rented an apartment as a young man at Powderhorn. And he said in this neighborhood, which is right across an interstate, the police were hunters. They acted that way. And my theory is that the um, aggressive, violence-prone policing in the blackest, poorest neighborhoods on the south side, that kind of behavior, a kind of policing that wouldn't be tolerated elsewhere, was brought down here, right? And so this is um, what systemic racism looks like. Uh, uh, it's structural. And Minneapolis, which has one of the highest levels of um, one of the highest standards of living in the country also happens to have one of the highest levels of racial inequality in the country. And it went through the same um, um, story I told you of great migrants um, and the construction of segregation. Um, so what I said was HOLC begins with redlining, and then the federal government piles on. Um, with a series of anti-black policies that cause cumulative blunt force trauma in black neighborhoods. Um, I'm not going to go through it uh, uh, line by line, but let me just say for the lawyers in the room or the law students in the room or the people who will tolerate uh, a little bit of law nerdiness here. Um, this, pe this slide is about the role of law in constructing uh, systemic um, systems of racism, right? So you start, you have um, uh, nasty anti-black stereotypes that are part of the politics and the political discourse that justify adopting a policy like, you know, redlining, uh, Euclidean zoning, um, basically privileging only single family detached housing over everything else. Um, and then the law is adopted. Um, and then the people who benefit from it, and even people who don't benefit from these laws, which typically benefited, again, economic elites, um, begin to get conscripted into participating in the institution, supporting it, and participating in the stereotypes. And you get this vicious circle that we haven't bro broken out of. The stereotypes change, the policies change, but we're, we're, we're trapped in that vicious cycle. Um, now, I tell the story of American residential caste and, uh, um, through a case study in the first chapter about Baltimore. And, uh, and yet what is residential caste? Um, what I say is that we uh, overinvest and exclude in affluent white space, and we disinvest, contain, and frankly, prey on people in high poverty black and brown space. And then we tell stories about the people in the hood to justify the way things are, right? Now, I quickly will say, so in Baltimore, uh, colloquially, the, uh, in Baltimore had the most free black people in the country uh, in the antebellum era. Those free black people walking around, living wherever they could afford to live is what inspired Frederick Douglass to free himself, right? Um, but they had the same thing of constructing black space. These, this is colloquially called the black butterfly and the white L. This is um, their, their red-lined maps. Um, oops, sorry. The, the purple areas here are the red line areas. I said there's this cumulative blunt force trauma. Next generation, you get uh, urban renewal projects 
that uh, displaced black people who had been strategically located downtown, right? So that's, that's 1,600 black people the federal government pays to move. You get a lot of displacement. The downtown is being reconfigured um, to, to switch from you know, factory smokestacks to professional living. Uh, it's really a whitening or a cleansing of the downtown area. Um, and then, well, let me just quickly say, where do all these people who get moved uh, by urban renewal, where do they end up? In Baltimore and a lot of places. Um, they get moved into public housing, again, paid for 90% of it by the federal government, um, intentionally assigned on a racial basis, intentionally segregated. So black housing projects for black people, white housing projects for white people. But what happens when you have a social policy that requires that 100% of the people in the building be poor and black? Overnight, you have created an intense concentration of poverty. I see my cousin. Aren't you? Am I? Am I? Aren't you? I, I'm pointing you out because I think you're. Well, maybe it's not my cousin. <laughs> you know what? You're not. Okay. You look just like I thought you were the daughter of my husband's cousin. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll claim you anyway. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's looking at this woman. This is crazy. All right. I apologize. I thought you were my cousin. Anyway, um, overnight you have created an intense concentration of black poverty that did not exist before. All right? So the processes of black avoidance become even more vicious, right? Um, then, you know, interstate highways again pile on. Anywhere the interstate was run, they typically mowed it through the most politically marginal neighborhood, which tip often was black, uh, black or brown, white ethnic, whichever group was the, the most politically powerless. But you know, this is an infamous highway to nowhere that mowed through um, um, uh, neighborhoods, black neighborhoods in Baltimore. Right. Now, the cumulative effect of all those policies um, is hypersegregation. In the 20th century, we had more than 50 cities, about 54 cities, in which black people were hypersegregated. Um, and you see, this is a um, uh, racial dot map from 2010, but you see the, 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 the black butterfly in green, the white and Asian L um, in, in Baltimore. Um, and I want to make it clear, and that Massey and Denton write this in American Apartheid, that black Americans were the only group in the 20th century subjected to this extreme isolation. Um, fortunately, only about 21 cities are still hypersegregated, but Camden, Philly, the Camden, Philly metro area is, is one of them. And one of the big messages of my, of my book is that, with hypersegregation in particular, um, the social distinctions that come naturally to people become much more efficient when you overlay geography. It's so much easier to point to those people over there and attribute the conditions born of eight decades of systemic disinvestment to attribute that to the people who live there. People who have no intimate knowledge of or experience with black people, where do they get their ideas about blackness? You know, I don't hold any punches. A lot of people get it from conceptions about the hood and what they think goes on there or what uh, the news tells them. And again, um, um, I can't remember whether I said this before or said it earlier. I had a session with law students, so I, if I'm saying this twice, I forget, forgive me. But the biggest myth we have is that high opportunity living is earned. High opportunity living is earned here in the affluent uh, white L, and hood living is the deserved result of individual bad choices, right? We say that to ourselves all the time. But the other thing that stark segregation does is it alters politics. It puts Communities of influential, wealthy elites 
in direct horizontal competition with powerless poor people for limited public-private resources. Um, and affluent people win over and over again. Um, I showed in the chapter on Baltimore. Baltimore has had a series of black mayors, still has a black mayor. Um, the uh, Baltimore City Council, to this day, the majority of the council is black, and yet, to their own horror, when they looked at the numbers, they realized that the city's capital expenditures, they were spending four times as much in white neighborhoods as they were in black ones, right? Um, the systems just seem to work that way. Uh, in the, uh, I showed you um, Paul Dragowski's map, and he had a series of 32 of them, right? And every city he showed uh, across the country was a story about concentrating affluence and concentrating poverty, right? And the story about segregation, it's gotten worse, not better. The most persistent types of neighborhoods are at the extremes. Um, and, and what's happening is it's harder to get into affluent white space. You have to be rich and buy your way in there, and it's harder to get out of the hood. The boundaries are hardening. And, but, but my message to you about residential caste is it's not just to the extremes. Um, everybody, I want to go back to, I have to find it. I want to go back to this map because this is where we are, right? Um, Everybody who cannot afford to buy a beautiful house in Rittenhouse, can you afford a house in Rittenhouse? How much does a house in Rittenhouse go for these days? Lots. Lots. <laughs> Everybody who cannot afford to buy their way into high opportunity, poverty free space, everybody that's excluded is actually subsidizing those communities with their tax dollars, with their gas tax dollars, with their sales tax dollars. All their beautiful infrastructure is being subsidized by everyone else, right? And so we actually have a system that benefits only a relative few, um, but what people focus on is this, you know, they focus on that. Um, um, but okay, so that's residential caste. Now, let's see where I am. Um, Okay, so I've talked to you about the past and how this got constructed. Now I want to talk to you, I want to make it clear. There are three present, current, anti-black processes that constitute current residential caste, right? And here they are, boundary maintenance, opportunity hoarding, and stereotype-driven surveillance. There's going to be a pop quiz at the end, <laughs> and you will get an F if you don't remember this, OK? Um, what is boundary maintenance? It's the maintaining of boundaries. And when you see the, the map, um, again, I prefer this one. Typically, this, this, this separation, it's often right across a, some boundary. It's an interstate or a river. But sometimes it's right across the same street. If anybody's familiar with St. Louis and the Del Mar Divide, shocking, shocking differences uh, above and below the Del Mar Divide. Um, well, boundary, oh, just since I got it up here, look at Chicago. Look what's happened in Chicago. Pale is middle income. Blue is very high income. Deep red is very low income. The middle class is basically being winnowed out. And what you got in Chicago is a serious tale of two cities. Black and brown, poor people on the west and south side, and very rich people, uh, you know, magnificent mile north Chicago, right? What do these folks get? They get a lot of policing, and they've gotten swaths of school closures and disinvestment. And what do they get? They get overinvestment. Three times as much public and private investment um, as in black areas. So don't be surprised in the summertime when a young man gets shot or hassled that you have droves of young people angry going down to the Magnificent Mile and looting. I'm not condoning it, but this is a recipe for, for social upheaval and disaster, right? This is not a city of opportunity for everyone. Okay, so coming back to 
Boundary maintenance. The biggest public policy today which supports boundary maintenance is exclusionary zoning. In um, many cities in this country, it is illegal to build anything other than a single family detached home in as much as 75% of the land. In the LA area, it's 78%. You know, surprise, surprise, they have an endemic housing uh, homelessness problem, right? Okay, um, opportunity hoarding, I've talked about that. I could talk more about it in the Q&A, but basically systemically over-investing in white spaces and disinvesting in black and brown ones for all kinds of public goods. Roads, water, sewer, schools, you name it. Um, and then surveillance, which people are more familiar about. There's been a, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter movement has been about that. But I want to underscore, it's not just state policing, but it's also civilians uh, appointing themselves to police back black bodies wherever they find them. And you know, the worst example, recent example, is the vigilantism in which people felt justified in shooting Ahmaud Arbery. OK, so what do we do about it? Well, I have the beauty of um, as depressing as this is, right? The beauty of understanding the processes is once you understand them, the way forward is clear. We just need to reverse them. We need to do the opposite. So inclusionary zoning, mandatory inclusionary zoning rather than exclusion, green lining rather than red lining. Um, uh, prioritizing new infrastructure investment in historically defunded neighborhoods. And it's easily, you just bring up the OJ, HOLC maps and you'll see a lot of them are the same neighborhoods. Um, and then humanization and care rather than um, uh, a, 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 a really sort of predatory style of policing. My number one the, 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 the final chapter of the book is entitled Abolition and Repair. And my number one step to abolition is to say we need to change the lens by which we see black people from presumed thug to presumed citizen. And, and once you, and I, and I invoke um, the ethic of love championed by bell hooks, right? that once you bring a ethic uh, and a lens of unconditional care, if not a agape love, but seeing people as assets worthy of the moniker citizen, people who um, are capable of transformation if given a chance, it frees you up to focus on evidence-based strategies that uh, have the possibility of, uh, that actually work that work better and cost less than um, very expensive predation. And so, um, you know, as I was, and I, I, and I want to say, well, actually, let me make this point. When I was writing this book, um, I thought that the hardest step to abolition repair was the first one, that getting people to see black people in human terms, right? And then this happened, the summer of 2020. Summer of 2020, 20 million, maybe so as high as 25, 26 million people rose up in this country, nonviolently protested in more than 2,500 cities and towns across this country. New York Times said it was the largest uh, social protest in the history of this country. Uh, in terms of numbers, you know, holding up signs saying that black lives matter, right? And yes, it's sort of, it's, it's, there's been retrenchment and there's been backlash, but I um, recently wrote a piece. I'm a contributing editor for Politico magazine. There's no paywall for Politico magazine. Um, I wrote a piece for MLK Day this recent January holding up progressive cities that are taking that new lens and actually beginning to innovate and do things that are, are steps toward 
MLK's beloved community. Um, and we, we could talk about that. But let me brag a little bit about New Jersey. Um, well, I'll start with Philadelphia. This is to give you a sense of this evolving politics, the hope I have in this country right now is in progressive cities that are not where um, political will is not artificially constrained by gerrymandering or an electoral college or filibuster, you know, these structural constraints. It is possible now to begin the policy kind of policies I talked about. Number one, I said. Mandatory inclusionary zoning. Philadelphia just adopted its first mandatory inclusionary zoning ordinance. It's not perfect. It doesn't apply to the whole city, but it reflects a very different politics than even a few years ago in which there was resistance and they couldn't, they couldn't get it through. It was voluntary, not mandatory. I'm going to brag on the New Jersey Fair Share Housing Center. You're in the house. Raise your hands. All right. So New Jersey, is, you probably have all heard of Mount Laurel and, and the, the obligation of fair share housing. Um, they have, they, the, the representatives who are here today tell me that they have negotiated, because of the threat of suing them, settlements with 350 towns in New Jersey in which they've agreed to adopt mandatory inclusionary zoning ordinances. Um, and, you know, more things are going on, uh, as I understand it. There's like a new fund that's trying to put more, $100 million toward basic systems repair um, in North Philly, these dis def you know, disinvested neighborhoods. And the point is, um, it's a beginning. And people, but people need to realize, as I show, right, okay, um, this history is long. This history is long, seven decades, right? People want change quickly. It doesn't happen quickly. We're just beginning. You, you put systems in place, and if you do nothing, they will, they will continue um, unabated. So we do need to work on building. This room is beautiful, by the way. I wish I could, if I had my camera, I'd take a picture. You hand me a camera, because I want to take a picture. I get pictures of myself, but I want to take a picture of this beautiful multiracial room. Y'all all wave. All wave. There you go. Okay. Text to me. Um, <laughs> you know, it, we, it's possible if we keep the fight up, and I this is what I tell particularly young people, you know, you never get to stop fighting for the country you want or deserve. Right, and I'm so happy to see younger people because you know I'm getting tired. Right, <laughs> but you just never do. And the thing, so I've told you the things that give me hope. But returning back to this global message of racial reckoning and civility, as we know, there are forces domestically and globally that don't want people to have the conversation we're about to have. Don't want anyone to talk about past, much less present systems. That's like you know, un-American or whatever. Um, and the thing that's really frightening is there's so much um, lying and dis disinformation and a new systems for disseminating it. I mean, you look at Ukraine um, and, and what Putin is able to do um, based on lies, it is frightening. So we have to keep fighting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Cashin, for a wonderful presentation and, and sharing your expertise with us. Um, we do have a little bit of time now for a brief Q&A with the audience. So I do want to turn it over to the audience members. If you do have a question that you'd like to ask Professor Cashin related to today's presentation, uh, please raise your hand. And we have some microphones floating around. Thank you for being here today. My name is Pam Mertzak wolf and I'm the director of pro bono and public interest at the law school. And what I'm thinking about is voting. And if, you know, these measures that you talked about on the slide with the three points that I'm not going to remember, so I'm going to fail the test, um, <laughs> are instituted because of policies, laws, and legislation 
And at this time, there is so much racist and corrupt um, uh, happenings in legislation to restrict voting. What do we do? Well, here's the thing. There's so many fronts we have to fight. And I, I say this in the final chapter, like while we're working on dismantling residential caste, we still have to fight these broader fights, right? And it's not an either or, right? Um, absolutely, we have to lawyer up and fight voter suppression. The really devastating thing about them gutting the Voting Rights Act is, you know, you don't have preclearance anymore. There's just not enough lawyers in the country probably to file an individual, is it section two or section five, I can't remember, but you know what I mean, file an individual lawsuit against that one individual practice, but we have to keep trying, right? But it also helps, I, I really, I've had uh, some of my former students run for Congress. I just am so impressed with young people and not so young people, I mean, Stacey Abrams, like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna run for governor, you know? Yeah, I'm going to run for senator. Yeah, I'm going to, you know, you have, by the way, my father ran for governor against George Wallace in 1970 <laughs> as part of a head of a, a, a alternative Democratic Party. But his, his theory was you got to run and put some candidates out there that um, energize people and make them want to uh, um, vote. That's voter suppression too, you know. There's and, and there's an energy deficit, particularly with younger people, right? So yes, but I don't think we we sh we can sit and wait um, to fix all that's wrong with American politics and the structures of it um, when there's possibilities of getting things done now in places where progressives do have power. So you, it's, it's both. And some people may be more jazzed about being engaged in the multiracial coalition for fairness and equity and inclusion right in the city. And some people may be more engaged with, you know, national fights or, you know, going to register people in Texas to flip it or, or whatever. But we need to do it all. I say, you know, pick your battles and, and join the fray. Yes, sir. Um, so wait, wait, let, let's let him get the mic to, to you. Thank you again for uh, coming out and speaking. Um, everything was, uh, all the information you provided was invaluable. I have a question uh, in regards to uh, when you said reversing some of the things that are in place now, how does that protect the, uh, how would it protect uh, black and brown people um, from their areas being gentrified and otherwise mm -hmm. continue to be pushed away? I get this question at every single presentation I make, right? Um, and so I want to underscore, and I say this explicitly in the book, that uh, any strategy of repair has to center the desires um, of what I call descendants, and that's a term of affection for me. People trapped in the hood, I call them descendants out of uh, acknowledging this continuum I'm talking about. Um, but they need to be um, in, uh, leaders. In, and, and I give an example of, uh, allowed to be leaders, I should say. Um, I give an example of a citizen budgeting process that went on in Minneapolis in which a trusted uh, community institution actually went and, and had an alternative process to the city council and had citizens from historically disadvantaged neighborhoods articulate what it was that they wanted to see happen in their neighborhoods. And they, you know, educated themselves about the budget. They were horrified to learn that Milwaukee was spending 48% of its budget on policing. This was before George Floyd got killed, right? And, you know, they articulated their three priorities. They petitioned the city for reallocation of funds from policing. And it, they weren't earth shattering, but they wanted more affordable housing. They wanted more programs for youth. And they actually wanted internships for youth, right? And they actually succeeded in getting the things that they asked for in a reallocation. I can't, if I say the figure, I'll be wrong. It's in the book. But it was the beginning of something dramatically different where they had voice, 
you know. And so I give that example. It's I've I didn't, I'm a policy wonk. I identified my preferred policies for re re reversing these structures, but we need. I talk about in the book what um, W. E. B. Du Bois and Angela Davis called abolition democracy, right? We need to build a new functional multiracial democracy, you know, where you win in public policy realms for whatever the policies are that descendants want and that other people want in their neighborhoods. Right, now, gentrification and displacement was, was at the core of your program. As a policy matter, I lift up um, land banking, which is going on in a couple places where assets are transferred directly to trusted community institutions with a track record and respect, an authentic relationship with the sentence, where you know, they have land that they will steward and they will build and maintain affordable rental housing that will never be sold. That you know, people may cycle in and out of it, but that they're they're that that the uh, there's a community institution that's empowered to pay attention to existing culture and holding on to that culture and having residents, longtime residents, be able to participate and stay. And there are other, I'm not an expert, but you know, you need money to build and maintain affordable housing as well. But that's one of the key, key anti gentrification strategies. Mm -hmm. We have time for just one more question. Hi, thank you very much for being here. I have one question. I mean, I've read A Color of Law, mm -hmm. which opened my eyes a bit. I'm halfway through your book, so don't quiz me. <laughs> I do have a question about the evidence-based strategies. You know, what I've read there in, in The Color of Law and your book and other things, there is a lot of evidence to show how we got in this deplorable condition, mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. So going forward, how much more evidence do you think we need, or how do we get it out there to the people who, you know, these people want it? How do you get it to the people right. who really don't want to listen to it? Right. So uh, I give the example of Minneapolis. You saw how starkly segregated Minneapolis was. They recently, I think it was maybe two years ago, repealed their single family zoning ordinance 12 to 1. 12 to 1. The, the one dissenter on the city council was the representative of that fluent quadrant I showed you. Surprise, surprise, right? But that was a radical transformation of their, even like three, four, five years before that, a mandatory repeal. Now every neighborhood has to be open to duplexes and triplexes. It's, it's a beginning. It's not the same as multifamily, but it's a beginning. But it is so radically different than almost everywhere else that has a single family zoning ordinance. The politics that changed it was some academics and um, community kind of agitators. You know, that's a positive word for me. That's Douglas, right? Okay. Um, they just gave a series of talks for like two years to community groups with the slides telling the story that I just told you. This is how we got here. All of the policies, and, the, and I, I attended one of them in D.C., where they had the maps and everything. Wake up, sir. I know you're asleep. I do this to my students. If I see a student fly, I say, wake up. <laughs> so I busted you. <laughs> anyway, um, sorry about that. So, but, but the, um, the guy who did this presentation for me said that over and over again, he would encounter whites who said, oh, I, I didn't know this. I had no idea. They were horrified. And, and, it, and then so their, their attitude, and you don't have to have everybody, but it's like, well, yes, this is wrong. This is unfair. This is antithetical to my values. We should, we should not be organized this way. And there was a, rea a realization that my lifestyle it's really been developed at the expense of swaths of people, and that's not right. And all you need is to get to 51%, but this was 12 to 1, you know. So, yeah, it takes years of work. Like, how long have you been working at this? The two people at the <laughs> Fair Housing? It's been 50 years. We're coming up on our 50th anniversary of this year. The 
the 50th anniversary of Mount Laurel. Yeah, yeah and it's like you're just, so, yeah, I mean, the work is long. But, but the God bless the people who do this work. And what, what, what I, I try to say in the chapter, and this is bell hooks, you know, what do you get? the privileged person who can afford to avoid poverty in your schools and your neighborhood. What do you get by entering this work? Right. She says, you, first off, when you, you, she says, first apply a lens of agape love to yourself. But by doing that, particularly with others, you are emancipating yourself from hundreds of years of dogma of white supremacy. You know, it's exhausting. You know, exhausting. And it's a society premised on violence, right? And you get to experience the joy of being in this multiracial fight. I, I come from a civil rights family. My parent, we were the only black family at the Unitarian Church in Huntsville, Alabama. And what did my father do? He recruited all these white hippies to join the um, sit-in movement. And nothing really threatened the whole you know, white power structure, white supremacists, than having a bunch of white people stand there saying, I want, uh, they sh I want to be part of this too. I want something different than this ridiculous racial order, right? So, you know, this is my new book that I'm working on about, you know, the spirit of abolitionism and, and, and you know, anyway. <laughs>